One word to describe Lawrence Taylor. Instinct. Son, I gotta do better than this. But when I say instinct, I'm not talking about instincts that you or I possess, like the need for self-preservation instilled by six million years of human evolution. Instead, Lawrence Taylor's instincts are wired for destruction at any cost, whether that means a quarterback, a ball carrier, or even himself. New York Giants star Lawrence Taylor was arrested on suspicion of drunk driving. Lawrence Taylor went to the Rockland County Courthouse and admitted guilt to two misdemeanor charges. Arrested again this week and charged with possession of crack cocaine in Florida. Looking back at the life and career of Taylor decades after the peak of his reign over the football world, it is honestly miraculous he's still around with us today. A walking reminder of not only what the pinnacle of NFL talent looks like, but also the cost of the unhinged mindset that made him LT. But before we discuss the dominance and debauchery that defines Lawrence Taylor's legacy, the slightest mention of this man's off-field activities is going to get this video demonetized. So for that reason, a huge thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring the channel. HelloFresh is a service that makes cooking gourmet recipes at home the easiest it could possibly be. You give them your particular preferences, and they send you everything you need to put a delicious meal on the table. It really is just that simple. You get fresh produce and ingredients in exact portions with detailed instructions. And my personal favorite part is that they have so many recipes, you're able to easily cook and enjoy things that you might have not otherwise tried. Before HelloFresh sent me the recipe for them, I had never cooked spiced chickpea bowls. But lo and behold, now they're a part of my go-to weekly meals. So if you're interested in mixing things up in the kitchen and making cooking totally stress-free, then go to HelloFresh.com and use code STE12 to get 12 free meals, and that also includes free shipping. Once again, that is code STE12 at HelloFresh.com for 12 free meals and free shipping. Definitely a great offer to take advantage of. So a huge thanks again to HelloFresh, and now, let's get back to the video. Most terrifying of the science fiction adventure. Most kids are afraid of what creatures might be lurking under the bed, but for grown ass offensive tackles of the 1980s, there was something far scarier and far more real lurking just off the edge of the line. It's not hyperbole to say that throughout Lawrence Taylor's 13 seasons, he was viewed more akin to monster than fellow man. A threat not only physically, but just as much, if not more, psychologically. Don't take my word for it though. Ron Jaworski, quarterback for the Eagles during LT's prime, once called a timeout after not being able to locate 56 on the defense. Turns out, he was just on the sideline getting his cleats adjusted. But how does a player become so feared that not having an eye on him at all times makes a professional quarterback sh bricks? Well, he certainly wasn't alone. Lawrence Taylor didn't even put a football helmet on until the 11th grade and was barely recruited out of high school. But once he switched to the linebacker position at UNC Chapel Hill, his ceiling was unmistakable. Named a unanimous All-American and selected number two overall by the New York Giants in 1981. Unnatural speed and disregard for his own safety became trademarks, with his coach at North Carolina saying that he would jump six or seven feet in the air to block a punt and then land on the back of his neck without hesitation. Of course, that complete recklessness wasn't just limited to the field. Considering the night that Taylor was drafted, he also drank 41 beers, more than enough Coors Light to kill most people and probably a small horse. I think that sets the table for what Taylor's extracurricular activities were going to look like, but that'll be the last off-field story I mentioned for the time being, because one of the most remarkable things about LT's career is that his destructive lifestyle didn't ever have an effect on his destructive impact on the field. You write, I'd go through an ounce a day, there were times I'd be standing in the huddle, and instead of thinking what defense we were playing, I'd be thinking about smoking crack after the game. Well, like, well, you gotta understand though, uh, it didn't affect my play. From the very start of his NFL career, Taylor carved out a place in football that would alter the game for good. To that point in football history, the most dominant linebackers almost exclusively played the middle. Dick Butkus, Jack Lambert, Chuck Bidnarik all made their impact from the center of the action. 
but built like a bull at 6 foot 3, 245 pounds with a 4-5-3-40, Lawrence Taylor would single-handedly shift that focus to the outside linebacker position. He was fast enough to drop back into coverage, but also unmatched in using his speed and power to wreak havoc on quarterbacks without them ever seeing him coming. LT ended careers by accident, so I think that answers the sh bricks question. Even football's greatest stars usually require a year or two before they're ready to take over the league, but LT's impact was immediate. His entrance into the league in 1981 couldn't have come at a more perfect moment, with recent rule changes that favored passing, encouraging quarterbacks to take deeper drops as longer route concepts developed. Put simply, they were sitting ducks, and Taylor was the apex predator. As a rookie, he helped push the Giants into the playoffs after an 18-year drought and even win their first playoff game in over two decades, with Taylor becoming the first and only man in history to win Defensive Player of the Year as a rookie. That rookie campaign would help motivate the NFL to officially start including sacks as a recorded stat, and Taylor would go on to average one of the highest sack rates per game at .79. But the sacks were really just a symptom of his main goal. Lawrence Taylor wanted to win, and he wanted to showcase why he was the best game in and game out, and he didn't really care if he had to break you in half to do that. To quote Taylor, I don't like to just wrap up the quarterback. I really try to make him see seven fingers when they hold up three. I'll drive my helmet into him, or if I can, I'll bring my arm up over my head and try to axe the son of a bitch in too. So long as the guy is holding the ball, I intend to hurt him." End quote. So combine that killer instinct, the big blue wrecking crew around him with some of the best defensive players of that decade, and two of the greatest defensive minds in NFL history in Bill Parcells and later Bill Belichick, and you had a recipe for pure, unadulterated violence. Hey, Sully, you better hope I never get back in there, I will kick your You've likely heard about his accolades, DPO-wise, first-team All-Pro designations, two Super Bowl rings, and the only unanimous MVP award ever given to a defensive player, but maybe the most impactful was the fact that opponents had to invent entirely new offenses just to try and slow him down. Parcells and Belichick didn't get cute in how they used Lawrence Taylor. They didn't care if you knew exactly where he was coming from on every single play. You still had to stop him. Washington head coach Joe Gibbs had that task of trying to contain LT twice a year, and innovated the two tight end offense and H-back position once it became abundantly clear that assigning a running back to block him was basically giving the poor guy a death sentence. Because Taylor was so dominant, every scout in the country was trying to find the next generational edge to build their defense around. And as it follows, if you're facing more and more elite blitzers, you'd better have a big elite tackle to handle them. Rinse and repeat that feedback loop for a couple of decades, and it's now an accepted fact that left tackle and edge rusher are two of the most critical positions in football. But long before your Khalil Max or Von Millers of the world, there was Lawrence Taylor so they partially have him to thank for how fat their contracts are. Teams have been trying to replicate Taylor's impact since the day he entered the league, but you cannot replicate the gift for violence that that man had. As Bill Belichick put it, what makes LT so great, what makes him so aggressive, is his total disregard for his body. When Taylor was in gear, he couldn't shift out of it. He even once played through a torn pectoral muscle and detached shoulder to record three sacks and two forced fumbles against the Saints. LT was wired in a way that did not have an off switch, and while that makes for one of the greatest legacies ever left on a football field, it would force his life off of it into complete darkness. The fact is, LT was more than a nickname to Lawrence Taylor. It was really an alter ego, the most badass man on the planet who answered to nobody and got everything he wanted. It really isn't hard to get addicted to the high of thousands of people chanting your name, and once you do, reality becomes kind of a letdown in comparison. So what better place to chase that feeling than in 1980s New York City? Lawrence Taylor first did cocaine during his rookie season. By year three, he was frequently smoking crack, and by the end of his career, drugs were the only thing he even looked forward to in retirement. Taylor was flat out so much better than other players in his era that he made no effort to hide that his focus was elsewhere. He wouldn't leave his house to party until midnight every night, often returning at 9 in the morning and sleeping through team meetings. But because he could stand up and diagram the entire scheme for that week at a given moment, he was left to sleep in peace. 
pitchers of alcohol, chewing glass as a party trick, and thousands of dollars on drugs and women became something of a ritual for LT, and when the NFL drug tested him, he'd use his teammates' urine samples to clear that bar. However, two failed tests would force Taylor into a choice between sobriety and being banned from the NFL entirely at the end of his career. But while LT had cultivated a legend around his ability to party and play professional football both simultaneously and harder than anyone in history, the less Taylor was focused on his career, the more addiction tightened its grip over his entire life. When Bill Parcells left the Giants in 1991 following their second Super Bowl win, Lawrence Taylor admits to checking out mentally from football playing three more seasons, but internally shifting his excitement to doing drugs again once he was free of the constant testing. After remaining sober at the end of his career for years, the day after his final game, he smoked crack. Later that year, the day the Giants retired his number, he smoked crack. And with nothing else to occupy his focus than partying and drugs among people that revered him as a god, Taylor would soon spiral out of control. The persona of LT remained in control of his life, but his post-football career wouldn't find nearly as much success as venture after venture fell flat, and despite entering rehab in 1995, over the next three years, he would be arrested for attempting to buy crack from an undercover officer two separate times. His once lavish New Jersey home descended into disrepair over a years-long binge, with holes in his couches, sheets over his windows, and concern from loved ones that he was on a one-way path to the grave. Taylor seldom made public appearances, but when he did, it was clear that he was very much in need of help, burning through the fortunes he had made in his career and harming both himself and his loved ones through the disease that is addiction. Fortunately, for Taylor's sake, help came in the form of rehab that he dedicated himself to for the first time in his life in 1998, eventually choosing to leave the temptations of New Jersey behind and take up golfing in Florida as a far healthier passion than the endless loop of self-destruction he'd cultivated. But again, Taylor could only run so far from his past ways, as he would again become tangled with the law in a messy 2010 arrest that I'm not even going to detail out loud to hopefully avoid being age-restricted. Now at 62 years old as of recording this, Lawrence Taylor appears to be living his life mostly without connection to the LT of the past, and one can only hope that things remain that way for the long run. Lawrence Taylor's story isn't exactly a heartwarming one. The reality is that the same destructive instincts that made him the greatest defensive player of all time also led to him nearly ruining his life and legacy entirely, and he no doubt battles those same demons day after day. His lifestyle and play style could never be replicated in today's NFL. The aggression, the drugs, the partying, none of it would fly. But in all honesty, that really only adds to the myth of LT. As football was finding its way into becoming the league we know now, Lawrence Taylor seized control and sent it in a new direction with his own sheer force, all while indulging so heavily in his own vices that it makes Gronk's partying look like child's play. It's certainly rare for an individual to serve as both the supreme ideal for one aspect of their life while also serving as the ultimate do not do this warning for another. But hey, Lawrence Taylor was just as rare as they come. No matter what, love him or hate him, we can all sit back and agree that there will never again be a player like LT. And I mean, if you think there might be, then the man himself has some parting advice for you. Gentlemen, what brings me to my next point? Don't smoke crack.